one artifact of this should be a, a GitHub repository um, if you guys want to clone it. Um, one test, if I did this well, um, is will you guys be able to clone the repository and get it running with a few simple commands? So part of the goal that I have um, and that you should also have with any project is to make it as easy as possible for someone else to take your project and start it up from scratch. Um, basically, they should be able to understand what needs to be done and you know, hit as few bottlenecks as possible trying to spin it up. At least that's the kind of approach I take. Um, lends a lot of credibility if someone can like read your repository or your readme, clone it and get it running without asking any additional questions. Um, and that kind of attitude is great when you're collaborating with others. You want to make it easy as possible to pick up where you left off. Okay, so um, I'm doing this all, by the way, uh, from the command line, most of it, and I'll be using Atom, which is my default editor, but uh, I don't have any specific reasons why I use Atom other than it's what I started with. So let's just call this, I don't know, Python project. And I'm on Linux, so most of the commands I use here should work on, say, Mac OS. Uh, Windows is a whole other story, but I know modern Windows builds come with uh, a Windows subsystem for Linux, which I highly recommend uh, exploring. Not too familiar with it myself, though. OK, so the first thing I always do um, is start by creating a virtual environment. So um, I don't know about you guys, but like my system versions of Python are pretty messy. So let's see if I think if I, yeah, Python by default right now maps to Python 2.7. I think I also have Python 3, which is Python 3.5. And I think it's, I also have a, a three. So I've got multiple versions of Python sitting on my system. Um, I don't want to use Python 2 anymore, but I don't want to have to type in like the specific version every time. I want to keep this project isolated from my system. And so this is where um, something like a virtual environment comes in handy. So Python has, uh, sorry, Python 3 at least. I'll use 3.7 for no specific reason. I think it's just the latest version of Python I've installed. So what I'm doing here is running the VN module. This is something that ships with later versions of Python. Uh, dash M is just saying like run this as the main module. And VN is what to call my virtual environment. So this is an argument to uh, the VN script. So when I do this, that um, created a folder in my root directory called VM. And this basically contains a distribution of Python. So the idea is to like use this version of Python uh, within my folder instead of the um, you know system level uh, version that I have. So uh, in order to start using it, I first need to activate that virtual environment. And uh, all this command is doing is saying, run this script. So in the bin folder, there's a script called activate, like a shell script that uh, does some magic um, and activates the virtual environment. So you can see it's active. It's showing me here in my command line that I'm there. So now if I go Python version, it's using Python 3.7, which I initialized this virtual environment with. So that's all well and good. That's a good start. Um, let's kick this off now with just a simple Flask app. So I'm just going to create a file named app.py in my root directory. Zoom in. Okay. Now let's see how well I remember this Flask boilerplate. Uh, from. I normally have to Google this, but I did this recently. So 
So I'm importing uh, the Flask object from the Flask library. I'm initializing a new Flask app. Name is like a sort of a special reserved uh, Python variable. That's like the name of the module you're running. So it's just like a good default to throw in. You could name this whatever you wanted though. If I wanted to name it app, I could, but this is kind of convention. Now this is not uh, a Flask tutorial, so I'll keep this simple. So um, this is just a, a decorator on the function. Um, and so when I visit a URL, that's just a, a slash no extra route, uh, it'll return this string. So of course I need to make sure I install Flask. And now because I'm in my virtual environment, when I do pip install, it's gonna only install it in my virtual environment. So it's not installing it globally. So uh, virtual environments are great because then you could have different versions of different libraries for different projects um, and not messed up your like system level uh, dependencies. So you can see if I look inside of VNV, I think inside of lib, no, inside of bin. Sorry, I forget where packages install. There, you can see Flask and some other stuff installed in there. Anyway. Um, So I should be able to just run this uh, simple Flask app with Flask run. So Flask run um, will look for a file named app.py and, and spin it up. So it's spin up a server. I should be able to look at it in my browser. Hello world, boom. So, um, Say for example, I want to turn this into a header. So uh, you can return HTML here and the browser will render it. Uh, but it didn't change. I have to first reset my server to get those changes. Now we can see it as a header. Um, but that is annoying. I want to be able to rapidly develop without having to, you know, control C and run flask run every time. And so what I want to do is uh, change the environment to development and then flask will be in development mode uh, or, or debug mode, which is super handy. And then anytime you make a change to your flask server, um, the server will reset. So I don't have to manually do it every time. So I can do that. Uh, there are a few ways. The way I usually do it is by defining an environment variable. So this is specific to Flask. Um, Flask will look for an environment variable called Flask env. And if it is set to development, it will um, it will spin up your app in debug mode. So export is just a Linux command to uh, set an environment variable. And then it's just name of the variable and the value like this. And so I, I should be able to like echo, which is just a print statement, essentially, um, on the terminal. If I ask go flack and dollar sign is like reference an environment variable, it's development. So I do flask run. It spins up in debug mode. So now if I make a change, let's say H5. It detected that change and restarted. And I've got a smaller title. Hooray. So that's all well and good. But one thing is annoying about um, this is say I get out of the terminal and come back to it. Uh, Python project. Uh, that's and let's make sure I, sorry, I'll activate my virtual environment again. 
but since I've closed my terminal session, I've lost that uh, environment variable. It's no longer set. Um, and so that's annoying. I don't have to do this every time I spin up this project uh, when I'm programming it develop in on my local. So this is why I pretty much always install sorry, a package called uh, dot env. So python.env, this is usually something I have to Google too, but again, I, I did this yesterday and it's fresh in my mind. Of course I need to install it. So the way this works is um, you define a top level file called .env and there you can set any environmental variables that you want to, um, to have preset. And uh, I can use this in my app by importing it. Uh, sorry, this is something I have to Google. There we go. No shame in Googling. From .env, import load.env. And then I run this command. And this will basically look for a top level .env file and define any environment variables that are set here. So it's useful, say, if there's like a, an API key or something you use on the reg, then you might, you know, store it here. Uh, Important to note that we, you know, if if you do have API keys and or secrets or whatnot in this file, uh, you don't want to include it in version control. But I'll get to that once we set up the Git repo. So now uh, I should be able to run Flask, run the Flask app, and it should um, load that environment variable and spin up my app in debug mode. Nice. All right, we're well on our way. So let's see, this is not a Git repository yet. Um, I think I'm just about ready to make it one. Git init. Uh, we've got a few untracked files. Now there's some of these that I do not want to commit to version control. So before I commit anything, I wanna make sure I'm ignoring those files. So in particular, .env, you don't wanna commit environment variables or secrets to version control. Um, VNV, that's where I've like got a basically copy of the Python distribution and all the libraries I'm using. It's also not something I want to commit to version control. And PyCache either, that's just kind of like temporary output from running certain Python files. So I will create a dot git ignore file, so git expects. And all you have to do here is, is specify like patterns for uh, matching files. So if I just include vnv on a line, that's telling Git to ignore any files or folders that match this name. Uh, same with .env and same with pi cache. Now, if you want, you could get more specific here and like explicitly ignore, say, uh, txt files. You can use like an asterisk as a placeholder, and you can get sort of fancy with your ignore rules, but this is generally all I have in my git ignore files. Sometimes if I've got a folder full of data, that's like way too big to commit to version control I like ignore my data folder. So if I save that and do a git status again, you'll see it's, it's ignoring everything I've told it to. So let's add those to staging and commit with a nice message. Uh, my default for git commit messages is using uh, the active voice uh, capital letter first, be very descriptive. Uh, in this case though, like it's my first one. So initial commit is okay. Cool. Now I want to um, 
share this on GitHub um, in a way that um, other folks can clone it and recreate it on their computer. So you'll note that I did not um, did not add the virtual environment to version control. So when I push this up to say GitHub, there'll only be these two files that get ignored in app.py. Um, and there's no obvious way for someone to know which libraries or Python modules are required. And so this is where a requirements.txt file comes in handy. So pip has a nice command called pip freeze. And on its own, that'll just spit out uh, all the Python libraries that are installed. And this seems like a huge list because I think I missed a dash L uh, for local. Yeah, okay. So if I do dash L, pip freeze will only look at my local virtual environment. So here's everything I've got installed, Flask and python.env, and then all these extra libraries that I assume are dependencies of Flask. So a uh, pretty common convention uh, for smallish projects is to store all this data about which modules and which versions uh, in a requirements.txt file. So here I'm just running the same command again, pip freeze L and these, uh, this command is simply like pipe that output to a file of this name. So it's just a convenient shortcut. If I wanted, I could just like copy this and paste it in the text file. But I want to feel fancy and like a hacker, so I do it all from the command line. And now we can commit that, add it, and commit it with a nice descriptive commit message. Add requirements.txt. Sweet. So now if someone wants to um, install uh, everything needed for the project, all they have to do is go pip install dash r for requirements.txt. And so this is saying uh, read everything from this file and install all those libraries and their specific versions. Of course, everything's already satisfied because I've already got them installed. Great. Uh, now let's um, let's wait a little bit before I push this up to GitHub. So the next thing I like to do on every project is set up linting. So linting is essentially like spell check for code, um, particularly handy for catching like weird syntax bugs, like you didn't define a variable right, or you're missing a definition, stuff like that. Also good to get everyone um, on board with the same sort of style conventions. So um, I'm gonna use a library called flake eight. And so flake eight is something that will um, check for, uh, check your files for uh, like for linting errors. And I'm doing a bad job explaining this, but it should be more clear once I run it. So flake eight and I run app.py, it'll basically like run that through, check for violations of pep eight, which is a style guide. Here's how you should like format your Python code uh, and other weird bugs. So let's see what it spits out. Ah. It's telling me um, one of its rules, specifically rule W191 is that um, it doesn't like tabs. I actually like tabs. Um, and there's a way to ignore specific routes. But let me give you an example of the kind of stuff you can catch. So let's say I have a random word. Right? This obviously, if I tried to run it, this will break. Random word is not defined anywhere. If I do flake eight, it should catch. Yeah. So it catches an undefined name, random word. So linting is good. I mean, you might think it's just for like styling stuff. It'll say like, oh, this line's too long or you didn't use the right formatting or whatnot. But it, it's really handy to catch, you know, weird bugs like this because this will make your software crash. So it's a good like first line of defense against um, silly bugs. 
Um, great. So if I just run flake eight, it'll be by default scan my whole root, uh, my whole directory. Now, this has taken a long time. And that's because I've got some large folders in here, particularly like my virtual environment and the, the git hidden subfolder. So I want to um, configure flake eight, sorry, such that it only scans the relevant files. So you can do this by, um, sorry, you can do this by, I think, passing it options. Uh, a lot of options you can pass to it, like ignore errors, um, exclude. So if I wanted to do like eight and exclude the end and dot get runs a lot quicker, right? But it didn't spit out any errors, which is interesting. Oh, there we go. Didn't like that space. So that's all good, but um, I can actually codify this in a config file. So um, dot flake eight. And here's where I need to Google flake eight config. Here. So here's where I can give it some like uh, so sort of like project level uh, options so that every time I run flake eight, it'll look at this config file and, you know, ignore the errors I tell it to and exclude the folders I tell it to. So I definitely want it to exclude .git and vn. And I also, I'm totally okay with tabs. So I don't want it spitting an error every time there's a tab indent. So I will tell it to ignore that. Great. So now if I just run flake eight without any options, sweet. So it ignored this thing because I put that in the config file and it didn't take a long time scanning through VN and dot git because I specified that here. So actually let's just get rid of that random word. Now I will, um, actually, before I add this, I want to make sure I include flake eight in my requirements. So I'll just like rewrite that. Add it all and commit it, add uh, flake eight. Awesome. So we're looking pretty good. Um, one thing I highly suggest is uh, most modern editors, sorry, will um, have packages that like do linting for you. So I believe I have one in Atom. I'm not sure if it's active. Yes, yeah, so I've got a linter flake aid package. I'm just going to enable that. And so that'll like highlight uh, linting errors like as you're coding. Huge, huge time saver, right? Because then you don't have to wait to run that flask eight, flake eight command. You can catch, you know, bad things as you're coding. So here my editor is now highlighting this as an undefined variable name, you know, and uh, you'll catch other weird things like. Catching here that I'm, I've defined index twice. Um, it's expecting two blank lines between functions. That's just a syntax thing for best practices. But you can see the value here. Highly recommend doing this on, on every single project. I uh, was getting a linter set up and uh, making your editor auto lint for you. Cool. So let's uh, get this up to GitHub. 
going to create a new repository. Python project is this taken? Yeah. I'll make it public. Uh, I'm not going to initialize it with anything. So to um, take a local repository and get it set up on GitHub, the first thing you do is set uh, set a remote. So git remote add is the command I'm running. And the arguments here are the name that I'm giving to that to remote. So this is just essentially an alias origin and then the URL of that remote repository. So this is just like, you know, a URL pointing to another GitHub repository. And I'm just calling it origin. That's kind of like your standard name, but this could be whatever I want it to be. And you could have multiple remote, multiple remotes defined on any Git repository. First I add it. Now I'm gonna push um, to origin my master branch. Sign in. Cool, so that should have done it. Okay, here's all my code up on GitHub. So we've got my requirements.txt, app.py, git ignore, flake gate. And you'll note that you know, the things that weren't committed did not get pushed up, like pycache vnv.env. Um, actually, one thing that you should do on every single project is include a readme, which I have not done yet. And at minimum, your readme should have like maybe a brief description of of what the heck the repository is. In this case, let's see, it's just a Python uh, boilerplate. And super handy, this will give you a lot of cred and make everyone else who wants to collaborate with you's lives easier is to put some instructions on how you actually use the thing. So in this case, you might uh, first install requirements. with a command like this. And then uh, run Flask app with a command like this. Um, and let's just leave this to the to-do instructions for uh, dot and variables. Um, any questions so far about anything I'm doing? Sorry, I don't know if there's anything in the chat. It doesn't look like it. All right. So a bit of an ugly readme. I'll clean it up later in the interest of time. But highly recommend adding a readme and adding instructions for for running the code and getting it set up. Gives you a lot of cred. Let's commit it, add readme. Great, and let's push that up to, mass, uh, to origin. Okay, so, um, so far I've been committing directly to the master branch. Um, which is fine when you're on your own, just hacking away. But as soon as you start collaborating with other people, um, convention is to leave the master branch, like to never commit directly to the master branch. What you want to do is branch to new new feature branches or whatever you have it, develop there. And then once you're ready, you want to merge that branch back into master, um, usually with the permission of the other developers working on your software, on the, on the code base. So, um, what I might do first on GitHub, let's see, I should have my readme up here now. Yep. Uh, is set up some super simple uh, continuous integration code. Um, so usually continuous integration means like, okay, let's um, automate uh, both the testing and um, quality checks of our code and um, 
and maybe uh, the CD aspect continuous uh, deployment is like automate the deployment of it. Uh, but for now, what I want to do is make sure that everyone pushing changes to the master branch is abiding by the same linting rules. So I do have Flakate running locally and whatnot, but nothing stopping someone else working on this project to push to master with with code that violates PEP8 or has uh, linting errors. So basically I wanna prevent that. So um, in the past I used to use CircleCI for things like this. Um, there's some other tools you may have heard of called like Travis and whatnot for doing continuous integration stuff. But now GitHub has their own built-in um, feature for this called Actions. Uh, and it's actually pretty awesome. So GitHub's got a nice UI for it. I'm gonna go over actions. They've got a lot of built, uh, pre-built ones that we can use. I'm gonna use this one, Python applications to start. So it's got this YAML file that it's um, making for me. Uh, YAML is kind of the uh, unofficial language of DevOps. So uh, you'll see YAML come up in all sorts of things where you're automating um, like sequences of commands or something to run on a remote server. So uh, GitHub's kind of nicely populated this for me with a, a lot of boilerplate. There's a name for it, Python application. Um, here's some stuff saying, when is this action gonna run? So in this case, it's gonna run when anything's pushed to master and when there's any pull requests. Um, made to the master branch. I'm going to keep that as is. I like it. And then here's it, it's defining uh, what, what to do. So basically what GitHub actions are is like at certain triggers, in this case, when there's a push to master or a pull request to master, it'll run the jobs here. It'll spin up some server and run this, what you tell it to run. So uh, jobs build, I'm actually going to rename this just call it lint, runs on Ubuntu latest. So this is just telling it what kind of base image to run on. I'm gonna keep that as it is. Uh, and here's like the steps it's actually gonna run. Um, so you don't need to understand this fully. Uh, there's a lot of syntax here that takes a, a bit getting used to. But what's going on here is um, first we're using a, a pre-built GitHub action checkout. This is just like, you, you basically need this in almost every GitHub action. It's just saying, uh, I think behind the scenes, like, uh, okay, take all the code in your repository and copy it into this new server that's being spun up by the action. Then we are going to uh, set up Python. So I think this is just another built-in GitHub action to install Python, the specific version. And, um, now we're pretty close to what we want already, but I'm gonna remove everything that's unnecessary. So the first thing we wanna do is install dependencies. It's got a name and then here's what's run and it's multiple lines. So actually all I wanna do, I just need one line because everything's in my requirements.txt. Pip install dash r. And lint with flake. And I'm gonna make this as simple as possible just make it run flake eight. And we don't have PyTest yet, so I'm just gonna remove that line. So um, yeah, uh, there's a nice UI here to just commit this. I'm going to say add GitHub action to run linter. And I'm committed directly to the master branch. If I wanted, I could create a pull request, which might be slightly better, but let's just commit it to master. After all, it is just me so far developing on this. So um, that actually added some code to my uh, repo. There's a .github folder now with the workflows and this Python app.yaml file. So if I do a git uh, fetch, and a git pull, 
uh, sorry, get pull origin master. I'll see that commit now that I made on GitHub in my local. And I'll see the corresponding, oh, dash A for hidden GitHub file. Here it is here. So I didn't have to use GitHub's um, editor uh, on, the, on the web. I could have written this myself here, uh, but it was nice to have that boilerplate already set up from some pre-built action they had. And I think actions is pretty powerful because they've got so many um, predefined uh, workflows for common things. So it's, it's a great way to easily get started. So um, where, oh, I lost it. So you see this little check, all checks have passed. So I, it's basically this, this action is going to run every time there was a push to master. So there was one push to master where I added this code and I can actually take a look at the, the code it ran lint and you could see it's stepping through all the steps in the job we defined, right? Set the job, checked out the code, um, installed Python, installed my dependencies and then linted and there was no errors. So we have a nice check, but let's say I want to um, push some new code. So I'm not going to commit right to the master branch anymore. Uh, now best practices is, is to do all my changes on a different branch. So let's add a new route to our Flask app. So I just went to a new branch. Let's go to app.py and add something simple. Uh, let's call it greet, take a name and return hello name now a uh, flat a uh, little flask tip but you can have dynamic um, routes like this oops uh, you'll see how my linter helped me catch some of these uh, bugs Linter plus editor uh, before I even ran any code. So let's see, is my Flask app running? Let's run it. So I should see this new route show up. Greet Russell. Hey, cool. So just a super simple thing to add. Um, but I want to show you what it looks like if I push some broken code up. So. We know this will break, but let's pretend we don't know and commit this anyway. Um, add greet route. Push this branch up to origin. If GitHub sees that new push in the branch. I'm going to create a pull request. Add greet route, sounds good. So what it should do is, yeah, automatically run that GitHub action. It's running this linter. I can check it out if I want to. Boom, so it, it hit that undefined name and crashed. So it's giving me a fail. Um, response. And I'll see that when I go to pull requests by a little X here. So super handy. This is telling me like, hey, this code in this uh, pull request is not meeting our tests. Right now our tests are super simple. It's just running a linter, but still it's catching a pretty severe bug. It's catching uh, something that'll break if I try and run this. Um, so quite common is to um, protections on your master branch, such that 
you can't, it won't let you merge the code unless the checks are passing. So a little key bit of security that's like, kind of like default set this up if you're working on a team together. Um, so you would go to settings and branches and I would add a rule, master, uh, require status checks to pass before merging. That should do it. This should not let me merge. There we go. Uh, I guess because I'm the admin, I can still merge this pull request, but anyone else would be blocked on it unless this passed. So again, just a linter, but what you can do essentially is, is if you have actual tests that are testing that certain critical parts of your code base are still working, you can set up a GitHub action that'll run all your tests and prevent anyone from merging in code to your master branch um, and breaking it. It's typically, um, convention is to keep master branch in a deployable state at all time. And so this is just a bit, little bit of security to, to set that up. And that's basically it. Uh, those are sort of like some of the first few things I do when, when setting up a new Python project.